Japanese knotweed was first introduced to the UK from Victorian botanists who brought it across in the first half of the 19th century. Um, they brought a lot of plants over at that time um, because they looked pretty and uh, from that first introduction it has spread almost entirely vegetatively, so um, not from seed, from uh, clonal pieces of, of plant being um, spread around the UK in, in waste material and, uh, uh, and people purposely planting it in gardens. Uh, and it now occupies almost every corner of the UK, at least in, in, uh, in each 10 kilometer grid square, if you like, across the whole country. The reason it's not a problem in Japan is that it's kept in check with various uh, pathogens, fungal diseases, bacteria, viruses, and invertebrates uh, and other species that, um, that, that eat it. If you take it out of that uh, balanced ecosystem into a new ecosystem where there aren't these controls, it can uh, blossom and, uh, and become invasive. I first encountered Japanese knotweed when I was uh, a student um, doing uh, conservation volunteer work and uh, I was working on a, uh, a conservation site where we were employing um, troops of volunteers to pull the knotweed up to try and, um, and kill it. But of course all you're doing there really is grazing it. It's a bit like mowing your lawn. If you just pull up um, the shoots, they're going to grow back. So it's not an effective um, treatment strategy. Also, some of that material can, can go dormant and uh, there's anecdotal evidence that that might be um, uh, as long as, a, as one or two decades. So if you were to treat Japanese knotweed with herbicide, think it's dead, if you were to then excavate that material to depth to say three metres to, for example, build a property, you could be exposing dormant rhizome and reawakening it um, for it to, to continue to cause a problem many years after it was treated. In a woodland, you do often see thickets of Japanese knotweed. It might be slightly less dense depending on the cover of the woodland. Um, but because it, it has uh, this energy really early in the spring to shoot up into, um, uh, into stems quite early, um, it will often do that before there's been uh, the opening of the canopy of the trees. So you will see it in woodlands as, as thickets. Any sort of earthworks that move soil around, if there's a little bit of um, knotweed rhizome, the root, in that material and it's moved around a woodland, then that, that's going to spread it. If there's a stream or uh, drainage channels that runs through a woodland, um, that can bring knotweed, small fragments of root, just the size of the end of your finger, um, if that's brought downstream from, from watercourse uh, further up, um, then that's a way for it to get into your woodland. Japanese knotweed is essentially a root. Um, most, its perennial life cycle is below ground in quite a large mass of rooty material that can, can be three metres or, uh, or more deep and spread more than seven metres than uh, the observable crowns um, on the surface. It mobilises that into this incredibly rapid uh, growth in the spring to throw up these shoots incredibly quickly. Um, you know, within, within a matter of weeks it can be metres high. And the energy required for that is, uh, is obviously not through photosynthesis because there's no green tissue at that time. In order to power this growth at the start of the season in the absence of photosynthetic material that can use sunlight, the cells in the shoots and buds are packed with the little batteries, which are the mitochondria. These mobilise the food store, the energy store, in the rooty biomass and in, in the shoots to power very rapid growth. And the, 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 the energy that's stored in the root replenishes those little batteries, if, if you like, um, to drive that incredibly rapid growth. Trying to understand how it generates so much energy from the very early stage where it's just a bud and it can grow up to 10 centimetres a day. So obviously this is a very important stage and we're trying to find out how the plant grows that quickly. What we have been doing is we've been using transmission electron microscopy to look actually inside the plant cells and to take a look at these batteries or uh, powerhouses to see if there's more of them, which would make sense because there is a lot of energy being generated, using different techniques to see if they're used in a more effective way in order to generate these massive bursts of energy that they have. Using the plants I have in the greenhouse, I have been setting up cell cultures, so growing plant cells in a liquid medium. Taking bits of the plant leaves, uh, we can grow the cells in suspension so that we can test how respiration works by taking it out of the actual plant and putting it in a, 
laboratory environment. The battery itself uh, in knotweed is comprised of these respiratory chain components that we can actually look down into them and the arrangement of these components. Thereby, of course, that allows us to make very targeted and specific inhibitors hitting just one or two of the components. By doing so, it stops the battery from working. It is very difficult to treat Japanese knotweed, and this is because it has this relatively enormous proportion of its biomass below ground. Um, so using a chemical treatment to get through the leaves of a uh, limited leaf area of above ground growth into that large volume of below ground rhizome uh, is very difficult. Other treatment methods focus on extracting all that below ground biomass and that involves uh, deep excavation. Um, there are ways that you can just you can uh, try to sift out the, the fragments of rhizome and separate that, that from the, the clean soil and reuse that. Um, or you just dig up an, a large volume of soil and, and dispose of it to um, a, a deep cell in a, in a landfill site. High temperature treatments such as steam or, um, or combustion or burning those fragments or simply crushing them until, or uh, fragmenting them until they won't reproduce. But those are inten energy intensive processes, they're very expensive, um, so they're not really effective for, for, for many sites. Biological control is a method of controlling Japanese knotweed by taking an organism that keeps it in check in its country of origin, bringing that to the UK and allowing it to be released into the wild. There is a group looking at um, a psyllid, which is a, a type of, of insect, sap-sucking insect, that is being explored and there are some field trials ongoing to see how effective that might be in controlling Japanese knotweed. However, um, it will only ever graze on Japanese knotweed uh, at best, so it's unlikely to actually um, change the laws it applies to, to controlling Japanese knotweed. Previously commercially available compounds don't specifically target this battery. Thereby, of course, the cell can still expand. The work that we're doing in the laboratory here, which is sponsored by the Biotechnology and Biological Research Council, through a studentship, and this studentship allows business and researchers such as myself to work closely together on an application that has direct relevance to the public. We go out into where the wild patch is, find some quite early buds, um, take them to the lab, wash them down so there's no, there's no soil or anything on them, um, take them back into the greenhouse and plant them. So um, there's quite a few that I've grown in here, um, including some different hybrids. So once they're prepared from the buds, they're put into a resin and these are sliced very, very thinly and they're used for transmission electron microscopy. The reason for doing uh, electron microscopy is to see the interior of the cells so we can quantify what's in the actual cells. In the laboratory, what we're attempting to do is to try and design a new set of inhibitors to prevent the battery within the cell from working. In which case, this would really stop the cell expansion and totally inhibit the growth of knotweed. There aren't as many mitochondria as you would assume in a very fast growing plant, um, so we're looking at different pathways at the moment to see if we can shed some light on how the plant generates so much energy and use that to try and uh, generate some new inhibitors that we can stop the plant from growing. There are a number of legal ramifications of having Japanese knotweed on your property. The Wildlife and Countryside Act, which makes it illegal for you to allow um, an invasive species like Japanese knotweed to spread from, from your site into the wild. And that has been shown in case law to, to, be, to mean allowing it to cross a boundary. Any material that contains viable knotweed uh, material, so small pieces of root, that must be handled as a controlled waste. Um, if it's not, it's very easy to spread it. Woodland and other uh, landowners um, have to be sure of their situation with regards to Japanese knotweed um, if they want to avoid any sort of litigation, enforcement action or prosecution. One good thing about Japanese knotweed is that you can eat it, um, which is something I do each year. I make a nice crumble um, and it's delicious. It tastes uh, a bit like rhubarb. <laughs>